put your hands together for me. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will enter his gate with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his court with praise. I will thank the Lord for he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. One more time. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to turn the service over into the uh, next person up to come. And we just praise again for you coming out on this wet jury day. Amen. Saints, stand with me, if you will. We're going to sing every praise to our God. I know we all know that one. So let's stand and give him praise on today and for this past week. Resurrection Sunday was a wonderful day. Thank you, Jesus. Every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. One more time, every praise. Every praise is to our God. They said, Sister Parsha, I said, Carol is down there singing. What were you going to sing? You want to sing something? Did you sing something? 
What were you going to say? Come here, I'm going to put you on the spot. Give us, that's what they plan. Give us this day. What's y'all, what's y'all plan? What are you going to say? See? Multi-talented. Our daily bread. You said you would. Upstairs today, and I know they're coming in. I tell you, I had so many leaders in the meeting. I asked them, Are y'all here every Wednesday like this? I gave them a hard time. I pray for your pastor. We appreciate what God is doing. How, how many of you enjoyed the last week or so as the Lord has blessed us during Holy Week? As, as people are gathering, we, we appreciate again. Uh, I can't uh, articulate how, how I was feeling. Uh, with the commitment of so many groups in our church uh, who work tirelessly and with expertise and with spirituality uh, to bring about, I, I think, the best Holy Week celebration we've ever had as a church. Yeah, we give God praise for that. And, and that was because people worked together, uh, people worked uh, in ways they had never worked before, and so we appreciate that. And as we move forward, uh, we look forward to what God's going to do uh, in the upcoming weeks. Uh, we will be sharing with you. In fact, it was my plan uh, to, to launch uh, the new series tonight. Uh, and then I decided to do something a little bit different. So we're going to be about a week off in the Pentecost rally. But we'll catch up uh, as we go along. Uh, as you know, uh, that Pentecost was exactly 50 days after the resurrection. Uh, the Bible says in, in Acts chapter 1, he showed himself alive to them uh, for 40 days with many infallible truths. And then we talked about how they then gathered together in Jerusalem, about 120, uh, and what the Lord did during that time. So you will uh, hear about this more uh, on our website and this coming Sunday as we count those 50 days. Again, we have to catch up uh, four or five days. We'll, we'll count those days. I'll be asking you 
to join with us uh, with daily devotionals. You'll, you'll get a copy of those on the website as well. Uh, there'll be topics that we'll be covering every single week all the way to Pentecost. Uh, and then we're going to conclude it uh, with a great Pentecost celebration. So you'll be hearing more about that. But the reason we not launched it tonight is because the pastor had already developed another class for the night. So I kind of bumped them a little bit. But we praise the Lord for them in Jesus' name. Um, they want me to announce to you that if you are re registered for one of our electives, Listening for Heaven's Sake, don't forget the first class is tomorrow, April 4th at 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Somebody say amen. amen. Also, Winners invites all ladies to a special paint, what is this, paint and sip? Huh? You paint? What y'all sipping? No, 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 never mind. Yeah, it's a special paint and sip on Saturday, <laughs> April 20th uh, for $35 per person, which includes all of your supplies and I guess your drinks. <laughs> I'll just kind of twitch a little bit. And also, uh, again, this coming Sunday, no, that's I mean, April 28th, another elective starts uh, discovering your spiritual gifts. Make sure to register. Also, to remind you that, again, every third Saturday, we have our AFC Justice Center. Clap your hands. Give God praise for that from 9 to 12. Uh, also, our World Vision 6K Run, Walk, and Ride for Water is going to be May 18th. I need you to go again to our website and sign up so we'll be prepared. Uh, what else? Bereavements, again, are on our website, AFC Chicago dot org backslash home going uh, again in Jesus name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise for this night that we have been given, a night of rejoicing, a night of thanksgiving. We ask in Jesus name that you'll be with us as we look into the word of the Lord one more time. Give us your mind and spirit. Help us to understand that we are called to the kingdom for a time like this. Let us, oh God, be receptive and let us be effective even as we are empowered by the word of God and as we share with others uh, in so many ways that we may all know you better and that your kingdom might come and your will be done. Bless those who are sick among us. You know every need. Bless those who are discouraged. Give them a spirit of enlightenment and a spirit of joy. Help us to be paracletus to come alongside and lift them up. Help us to be vessels in your hand that are meet for the master's table. We'll give you all the glory, honor, and praise because it's yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God your best praise. And before you sit down, give the Lord praise to those who have joined us by way, again, of the internet, by the hundreds. Come on, clap your hands, make them feel a part. Uh, you may be seated. Well, again, we're, we're starting, we're going to start uh, again this new area of, of, of journey into Pentecost. Uh, and, and, and by the dates of the calendar, as Julius should have started again with us uh, on right after Sunday, uh, those, those, the day that he got up, but we'll be starting again uh, very shortly. But one of the things that I wanted to share, and I had worked on this already um, with you, is some things that I had said to you this new year as we started looking at Jesus as Lord and things like that. And one of the things that for me has been very insightful and it helps me even today uh, as we walk with the Lord is some of the, the, the dynamics of learning and of growing in Christ that Bishop Holly gave to, to us as a congregation uh, and to all of us uh, as a people uh, even as we were growing in the Lord. And so we, we attempted in the last couple of weeks right before, again, Good Friday, to, to walk with Jesus uh, the last, uh, again, few days of his life. And we spent some time doing that. But I really thought that I would like to give a Bible class to that teaching, uh, again, as we look maybe a little bit more intensely, maybe it will become a reference point for all of you to how to know the Lord. So tonight, I want to talk about uh, the progressive walk of knowing God. Uh, and I want to start with a scripture that I think you're familiar with, and that is Proverbs 4 and 18. You see it on, on the screen, right? Let's read, read it together. Okay, the path of the just, that means the church, is as what? The shining light that shineth more and more to the perfect day. 
the NIV says, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. It means that, and we know this, but I want to give you uh, one of the uh, methodologies that Bishop Holly taught us on how to effectuate growth in your life. He always said that we say it and it's true that Jesus is our example. Somebody say amen. amen. So if you really want to have a framework on how to grow, you can really look at the life of Jesus. And so I want to tonight in about 20, 25 minutes at the most, uh, try to condense it, but spend a little bit more time than we did a couple weeks ago on looking at how to walk with God progressively using the tabernacle as an example. Somebody say amen. amen. So uh, again, uh, in, in Isaiah, uh, the, the prophet says this, and, and again, let, let me be honest, that the application of this, of this text uh, for us today is different than what Isaiah meant. Isaiah was dealing with some people uh, of God that really had not done God's will, and, and the Lord was upset with them. And so uh, Isaiah pointed out to them the mindset of people when they are going their own way. Uh, and then and he, he breaks in here at the ninth verse of the 28th chapter saying this, whom shall he teach knowledge? Talking about the Lord. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? He says, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Notice, how will God allow us to grow from where we are to where we need to be? He says there's a certain mindset that you must have for that to happen. If you want to know how to walk with God, knowledge of God, doctrine or teaching. He says to do that, you must be ready to be weaned from the milk. Remember in, what is it, in Hebrews where, where, where the apostle says, I want to give you meat, but I couldn't. I gave you milk because you were not able. Not because it wasn't time to give you meat. He said they had not grown to the point to handle it. And so he said, I had to keep giving you milk. Uh, here in Isaiah's time, they are upset with the prophet. They said even pro when, the, when Isaiah preaches, he gives us these, these infinitesimal, these very small principles that we all, it's like he will teach us our ABCs in God. And what Isaiah said was, all I can give you is ABCs. I'll give you anything more. You're not ready for it. And so he uses this terminology. He says in, in verse number 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And the next verse says, shall I speak to this people? And so the, the prophet says in, in, in so many ways, God wants to give you more. But he's not going to waste principles if you have not done the first principles. Somebody say amen. amen. But the point there is that we who have been born again, we who want to walk with God, have to know you can't get the Holy Spirit as it seems like sometimes we do. Then we just you know, say, I made it now. You know, I, I'm, I'm here. No, you're starting. Everybody say starting. And so uh, this is the only, I guarantee you, this is the only slide that's a little bit crazy with terminology you may not be familiar with. And I shared it upstairs with, with the ministers uh, and others. Uh, uh, again, uh, in, in certain uh, genres, th there are these words that have Latin derivations that teach us principles. And, and so I said to them upstairs, what does the word orthodoxy mean? And what does the word orthopathy mean? What does the word orthopraxy means. These are not common words that we use, but they can be applied to our spiritual lives. Because when you, when you use the term orthodox, it means simply right thinking. You know, the Bible says, uh, example, there's a way unto man that seemeth right, but the end thereof is what? The way of death. So just because you think is right does not mean it's right, but orthodoxy is right thinking or correct belief. The other term that I wanted them to consider was orthopathy. And you, you remember that word, pathos. We didn't hear so much this season. It used to be years ago, during the Lenten season leading up to Calvary, we heard a lot about, how many remember the, the, the I think it was the movie, The Passion of Christ. That's that word, pathy. That means the emotion, the feeling of it. So, orthodoxy is right thinking, orthopathy. Pathy is right feeling, 
or emotions. And then the last one is orthopraxy or right doing. So when we walk with the Lord, we want to be congruent with all three of these. And, and they, do, they should go in your life in a certain order. Oftentimes, we do in the Lord what we feel led to do or what our emotions tell us. But you must be careful. You must start with what God says. Nobody said amen. amen. You know, I, I wonder if this is right for me. Well, it feels right. I, I think this is the Lord talking to me. Well, be, before you get your emotions evolved, you better ask yourself, does the Lord teach me anything? Wow. Ouch. In, in some ways, our society, we have abandoned the primary issue of the Word of God. I said something upstairs. I, I know I'm sometimes controversial. I said, when somebody says to me, I know this is what God, God's Word says, but I tell them right there, you a liar. I don't even let them finish. You lying. Can I tell you something that you already should know? God is not going to change His Word to suit you or me or your mama or anybody else. The word of God, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away before what? One jot of my word will ever pass away. It means God's word is already settled. And so what we believe about it does not make it what it is. It is that because God said it. I thought I was in the right church. And so orthodoxia of what, and, and again, I understand what, what you're thinking that uh, to, we, we must also interpret the word of God. There is no question about that. That biblical hermeneutics is important, and to understand, Bishop Hollywood say all the time that a third grader can read the Bible, but it doesn't mean they can understand the Bible. So, yes, I give in to you that we must understand it, but the question becomes, who has a right to, to, to weigh in on that? It cannot be individualization that she thinks it means that, and he thinks it means that, and I think it means this, and the Bible says that the Word of God is not open to private interpretation. Well, I know that's what he, what so-and-so said, but I feel like God is not schizophrenic. His word has gone out of his mouth. It will not return empty. It will prosper in what he sent it because God has intentionality about what he wants us to understand. So tonight, if you don't get much further, let's, let's deal with this, that we want to be able to, to grow in the Lord because we have, de we have decided I'm going to choose to do it the way God says it. I want God's mind about it. Then I want to, and when I get God's mind, he will then affect my feelings about it. And when my, his mind affects my feelings, then my feet and my hands will do what he says. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, that's, that's the progression of walking with God. That's what he means that the path of the just is as a what? Shining light. It gets brighter and brighter as we live for the Lord. So, Again, another scripture that may help us in this issue of progression is 1 John chapter 3. I think most of you already know this verse. Uh, it begins, uh, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love. Look at this extraordinary love that God the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called what? Sons or children of God. How many are glad he's called you his child? No, for real. Then, then clap your hands. Let me see if you're still awake. Yeah. The, the writer said, can you believe this extraordinary gift of God that we, you and I, should be known as his children? He says, therefore the world, what, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Then he says in, in, the, in, the, in the scripture here, beloved, what? Say now. now. He said, if you've been born again right now, you are a child of God. Are you happy about that? Yes. Yeah, right now, you are God's child. Then he says, and it does not appear what we shall be. Now, that's not what we hope to be, but what we shall be. So if you are a child of God, you should have great assurance, I'm going to be that and better. Woo. Say, say neighbor. neighbor, the best yeah. is yet to come. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, I was uh, talking to a friend of mine uh, at, 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 uh, at Northwestern the, at the hospital because some things that had happened. And, and, and they said, well, what we heard about it, it was only, it was so small, we didn't think it was that important. I said, you know, tadpoles become frogs. Some of y'all may get that. 
If, if, you know, certain things are going to become something because of what they are. Oh, you missed it. No matter how small they are, if, but if this is the genesis of it, and you know the DNA and whatever, then in a few weeks or months, it's going to be something else too. That ain't, that ain't, I hope it will. No, no, no. If it lives, it's going to be that. Why? Because that's what it is. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spiritual. He says, and it does not appear we shall be, but we know, we have this assurance that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. It doesn't say wait till the rapture and then be like him. You know it's not saying that. It's saying in that time period between what we are now, what we're going to be, there's some things we must be doing so that we will become what we started out to become. That, that, that's the word of God. So, so quickly, the question becomes, where will God dwell? And we don't have a lot of time to deal with this, but you know God will not dwell everywhere. Say amen. amen. You know, the Bible is, is resplendent with, with terminology where he will not dwell. But we know from Scripture that we're given examples of where God will dwell. God will dwell in the tent of the tabernacle. And we won't have time. I have some scriptures on, on, on these slides. Write them down. We don't have time to go through all of them. But in every instance, what the Lord says, God gives instruction about what he wants things to be so that he can inhabit them. Anybody here want God to inhabit your life? How many know that he being in you has made the whole difference? And you know that in your path, in your future, there are going to be great tests and trials, but you're not afraid for the Lord is with you. Oh, you, 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 you almost got it. You almost, you, yeah. It, you know, if the Lord brought you out in that thing, why do you think he won't be out from this thing? The thing ain't the thing. The God in the thing is the thing. So the issue is God in me, Right? So that's what he means about he dwells in the tabernacle. He dwells in the temple of David and of Solomon. He dwells in the church, and he dwells in you and I. What? Know ye not that your body is the what? Temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, because they all belong to God. That's what God will dwell. So again, you probably can't see this, and I tried to have them make it as big as I could. And I, I remember Bishop Holly had a mock-up of the tabernacle, and he kept it uh, for Bible classes. I don't know how many weeks, I don't remember. But he had us read about the tabernacle because in Exodus, the Lord says to Moses, make me a tabernacle. He says, make me a tabernacle. Why? That I might dwell with them. God had never dwelt with a people before. But when he chose Israel, he said, I'm going to dwell with you. You ought to get happy. Because how many believe God chose you? If he chose you, he plans to dwell with you. Right. So the tabernacle, and again, we want to spend a lot of time, becomes a graphic picture of God dwelling, and it will show you, if we had more time, the progressive nature of knowing God. Right? So here is an outline of, of the tabernacle. In fact, we've got, I think we've got a couple of pictures. That's one, and then they, they put another one up there. It, it might be a little bit more graphic. I don't know for some people. But again, it, it would be important for us to study the tabernacle. Why? Because God said, I will dwell there. Yeah. Now, and when you look at the tabernacle in Exodus uh, and Leviticus, uh, through, throughout uh, the scripture, God is very exact. Now watch this. God said, I will meet you. What did he say he would, in the tabernacle? What did God say, I'm going to meet you? I will meet you between the cherubim above the mercy seat. Can I tell you something? You only want to meet God above the mercy seat. Hey, you don't want to meet God anywhere else. No, 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 no. God is holy. You don't want to meet God in a place where mercy is not resplendent. You don't want to meet, <laughs> you don't want to meet God for judgment. You want to meet God for mercy. Therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace so you may find mercy and grace to help in the time of need. So, so he tells, says to Moses, I'm going to meet you above the mercy seat, but build the entire tabernacle because there's a progressive walk with me. 
And so uh, in knowing God or getting to know God, there is a progressive nature of what can happen in your life if you apply yourself to the tabernacle because he's going to dwell in the tabernacle. But the tabernacle is, re is reserved for the people of God. Say amen. amen. So notice all the way, again, where it says gate at the lower portion or where it says east, that's the entering into the tabernacle. So when you are born again, you are entering the tabernacle. The, and again, let's, let's quickly go through what you will meet in the tabernacle. First thing you meet in the tabernacle is what? Y'all know this. What, what, say it loud. Let's say for me, brazen altar. Or if you're really courageous, the altar of sacrifice. Ooh, I felt that. So how many want to want, want to enter in with God? They want God to enter in with you. What's the first thing you must do? Die. Say die. die. The brazen altar is different from any other altar in the Bible. Because the brazen altar, whatever you put on the altar, has to be burned up completely. Ooh, we, we need about four weeks on that one by itself. It, yeah, it, you, it, nothing's left for the priests, nothing's given to the people. It all goes up to God. You must burn everything. Listen to me. I don't care what you've been taught about being saved. You must die. <laughs> the first step is I surrender, right? And Jesus, again, is a type of brazen altar. So if we had time tonight, I may not go back to my slides. If you look at St. John chapter 12 through chapter 17, what happens in chapter 12? Chapter 12 is that famous chapter where the Lord says, except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it what? It abides by itself. But if it dies, whoo, hallelujah, what will happen? It will bring forth a great harvest. Let's go through that again. The Lord said, except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it's by itself. But if it's willing to die, it will bring forth a great harvest. Wow. Everybody says, I want a great harvest. Well, you can have it, but you have to die. <laughs> So when he says in, in chapter 12, no man takes my life, I lay it down. That's the brazen altar. You want to know the Lord? Visit the brazen altar. Die and go into the ground and watch what God does for your life. And, and that's chapter 12. So you, you, you go to the brazen altar first. What's the next thing you see on that, that pitiful kind of graphic that I put up there? What's next? Say the laver. Well, somebody helped me. They said, they said the outer court. The outer court was open to you even though you were not a priest. The outer court is large. You have entrance through the brazen altar, but you can't go into the holy place. The outer court. And so when you walk with the Lord, don't get stuck in the outer court. Don't get stuck at the brazen altar. Go a little bit further. How many of y'all were here for the foot washing? Was that fantastic? That was, the, that was the labor. That's chapter 13. Chapter 13, if you read it in its entirety, it will blow you away. Do you understand that Jesus took off his outer garments and washed every one of the disciples' feet? Wow. And when he came to Peter, and I don't know if Peter was the first one. I think he could have been the first one. Peter says to him, you're not going to wash my feet because Peter understood what the other ones understood too, that only the lowest servant would wash somebody's feet. And Jesus, on the night he was to be betrayed, took out off his outer garments and washed the feet of the disciples. Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. Look what the Lord says to him. If I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. Again, Talking about progressively knowing the Lord. you made the entrance. You, you've given yourself to the altar of sacrifice. But once you are born again, remember something. Your feet get dirty. I've said to this church many times that, you know, if, if, if being saved was about going to heaven, God would save you and then kill you. And you go to heaven, right? 
Because if he leaves you on the earth, okay, I'm going to see I got some honest people here. What happens if you get saved and God leaves you on the earth? Uh-oh, anybody going to say, Dan, Daniel, they're not going to say a word. They ain't going to say, you, somebody said you're going to get saved again. That's the foot washing. <laughs> because if you stay here in this mortal body, you are not going to live perfect. But it does not mean you're not saved. Okay. He says to Peter, if, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. Peter says, if that's the case, give me a bath. And the Lord says, there's no need for that because you're already cleansed, but one of you. I hate to throw a monkey into your, into your joy, but one of you is a devil because I, I know all of you when I chose you. Now, now, we don't have time even to begin. If we had the time, we couldn't explain that verse. How, how, why would the Lord choose Judas knowing who he was? Did Judas have to do what he did? I don't know, but I'll tell you this. It is an example to all of us. Don't be so such much about how saved you are. I can do whatever I want to do. I know I'm saved. You better watch yourself because Judas was saved too, supposedly. Chapter 13, if you read it, it's, it's the greatest commandment. He says, what I have done to you, you must do what? You must do to each other. If I, have, if I, your master, have washed your feet, you ought to be washing one another's feet. That means because you are the church does not mean you're perfect, so you need to be washed on the things that are exposed to the world every day. Your hands, your feet, whatever. And who's going to wash them? One un say one another. One another. Okay, I got to go quickly. So that's chapter 13. I still didn't have time to go to well. I said, too bad. All right. So we go to the, to the labor. And, and then from the labor, what, what's the next thing you encounter going in towards the mercy seat? Huh? The holy place. But remember, there's a curtain there. Because everyone is not welcomed in the holy place. Perhaps the holy place is a place of sanctification. That people get saved, but they're not willing to commit to him. You are not your own, bought with the price. Notice it, that from chapter 13, you go to chapter 14. What's the first thing he says in chapter 14 in verse 1? Some of y'all know because you're ministers. Let not your heart be troubled. Right? He knows now you, 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 you visited to the bronze altar, you've been to the laver, but now you've got to enter into the holy place. Hallelujah. And he says, and the holy place is reserved for those who understand some things like this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And somebody who was honest says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? He said, I'm the way. See, the holy place begins to give you an understanding that most folk in the church don't have that understanding. It is an intimacy with Jesus. Chapter 14 is filled with that, that he gives them in chapter 14 relationship understanding. And let me, may, may I get fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a place of intimacy because you are going to the holy place. He comforts them with the promise of the Holy Spirit because you're going to be challenged. If you, how many of y'all want to please God? You intend on pleasing God. You're going to be challenged. I'm going to tell you right now. It's going to be challenged from without and from within. I remember going to Bishop Holly, saying to him, Bishop, I believe I'm called to ministry. He told me, you're in for a fight. He explained to me. I said to him, I believe I'm called. He said, of course you are. I said, you never told me. He said, what's my place to tell you? It was my place to affirm it or deny it. And so he walked me through some things very quickly about what it means to be sanctified. She said, I know you love the Lord. You need to be closer to God. And then he told me the ones that are in my life that I must embrace even deeper because if the enemy can't get you, he's going to go after them. The approach to God is not some Mickey Mouse journey. It's a walk of understanding. And so the holy place is reserved. If we had time, we go through, there, there, there are three things located in the holy place. 
What, what's one of them? Somebody give me one. The, the table of showbread. How many, how many know about the table of showbread? Really, the table of showbread is a type of Christ. The table is Christ. But what's, what's critical is what's on the table. <laughs> Hallelujah. Christ is the table, but the bread. Who's the bread? Say, I'm the bread. That's why they had to bake the bread fresh. They couldn't have stale bread on the table because the table of showbread was you and I. And it's, it, I remember when Bishop Holly talked, he must have taught me this. I didn't, couldn't lay it on my own. He, he said, it's like it used to be in Chicago during Christmas time. You reserve days to go down on State Street to look at the display windows and to see the finery that he had put in Marshall Fields and Montgomery Wards. And he said, that's who we are. He says, when God wants to make a statement, he puts you in the display window and you become the showbread. You're supposed to show off for God. He was to look at you and say, that's how God is. I, w- I want to be like that. I want to buy that. I want to have this. Give the Lord praise right now. You're showbread. You are showbread. What else is in, in, in the holy place? Candlestick. Remember, what is it, back in the end of November, December, I tried to preach a series on the whole issue of the anointing oil because the oil is what supplies the light to the candlestick, and the candlestick is also represents the church, but the gold part is God himself, but the oil is the anointing, but it's only found in the holy place. <laughs> Come walk with me with Christ in the tabernacle. Stop at the table of showbread. Go to the, ca- to the candlestick. And the, remember Revelation was chapter 1. He says, and I saw one walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. As Christ walks among us and expects you and I to be the candlestick with the anointing oil. What's the third thing in the holy place? The holy altar of incense. And the altar of incense is so powerful. It's not like the burnt offering in the, in the altar, it's when the vials of praise and prayers go up before God as a sweet-smelling savor. There's smells in the holy place. There are is furniture in the holy place to remind you of your call to God to be sanctified. And if you have the courage, you'll walk with Him. I got I got to close. And then after you get into the holy place, what's next? The veil of the temple, the veil that was rent. Uh, in front and back, if you, if you remember when he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the veil of the temple was rent because it was only pierced once a year when the high priest went into the holy of holies with the blood of the sacrifice. Because you have not been redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold by the precious blood of the lamb that was slain before the world began. I know Easter is over. I want, to, I want to preach about that lamb again on Sunday. I want to talk about that blood that was shed at Calvary's cross. I want to talk about that that blood only saves you, it cleanses you. That that blood delivers you. That blood gives you power that you know not of. It's the blood of the lamb where the victim becomes the victor. Hallelujah. Praise God for the blood. So the high priest went to the Holy of Holies once a year and he poured the blood on the mercy seat above the cherubim and the fragrance of God enveloped Israel. And the Bible says as long as they worshiped before the altar in in the tabernacle, they never lost a battle because the Lord was among them. They went through terrible things but the Lord was among them. And if I can just take license, the one time they lost the ark, you know what happened? Eli said, Ichabod, the glory has been taken. The presence has been taken. Because now there's not a place for God to dwell in. In the New Testament, we, you and I, become the tabernacle. I would to God as we traverse the next seven weeks, we talk about Pentecost and what it really means, that we will have the courage to look at what it means to walk with him. Those 50 days from resurrection to the pouring of the Holy Spirit, you will have these glimpses of the tabernacle and God's presence. 
and the power of God when he infills the people for the first time with the Holy Spirit. So tonight, I'm going to go to the end. We have a couple of questions. I'm going to go upstairs uh, for about 10 or 15 minutes with the online guests. And even though I didn't go through all of these things, we tried to, you know, I didn't really get to chapter 15. Let's see, y'all should let me. Chapter 15, one of my favorite chapters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, look, look, look at Jesus. Look, look, look at him in the tabernacle. I am the vine. You are the branches. <laughs> you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I, and I have ordained that you go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit might remain. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Don't let the devil fool you. God wants you to grow and prosper and produce in him. Yeah, clap your hands. Yeah. It, it's, it's in chapter 15. He said, I have called you servants. I call you no longer servants. I call you friends. Because the servant knoweth not what the vision of the master is. But now I embrace you as my friend that you might be empowered to do my work. Yes. Chapter 16 gets even deeper in the issue of sanctification. In chapter 17, we won't get to it, maybe another time. Chapter 17, again, you, know, you, say, you say about everything. One of my favorite chapters. And it's very painful. Read chapter 17 this week in preparation for the Holy Spirit. Read chapter 17 of St. John. Read where he says, Father, I'm coming to you. You have given me these people and I have not lost any of them except the son of perdition who was a demon from the beginning. Now as you have been with me and I've been with you, glorify thou now me with the glory I had with you. And then take that glory that we share together and put it on the people that I'm going to leave here. I'm going out of the world. They stay in the world. Give them the, the oneness I have with you that you have with me. And he goes on down praying that they might be one as I am in you and you are in me and we are in one another. He preaches this thing that I tell people all the time that number one, humility is the first character of the Lamb. N number two, he's talking about unity. Unity is more important than you being what you call right in your mind. It, it, is the, it is the division of the people of God that the enemy hopes for because he cannot win if we are unified. Yeah, that's right. He cannot win. The, 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 the whole focus of the church should be that we might be one in him. And that means we have to surrender sometimes our will to his will. And so I was supposed to go upstairs five minutes ago. I'm going to go upstairs now, but I'm going to take you to the last two questions. And I apologize a little bit. Yeah. And, and those are our questions for tonight. You're in your groups. If you're not in your groups, go to your groups. I'm going to run upstairs for about 10 minutes. Then I'm going to come back down in Jesus' name. Everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome all to the eChurch, the streaming platform um, of the Apostolic Faith Church and our Wednesday night Bible class. What an awesome, awesome lesson uh, by our bishop. Wow. Just coming from or out of the Lenten season and Holy Week, uh, moving into this dynamic teaching as we like to uh, term it, we, we've uh, titled it or themed it. Uh, for this season of teaching on earth as it is in heaven. And what an awesome job uh, tonight, our bishop, who started us out teaching us about the, the high priest and the tabernacle and its relevance or relationship to uh, us walking with Jesus. So many salient points, so many things that uh, casual Bible readers may not in, uh, uh, discover. You know, when we look at the Bible, we must know that the Bible is a book given to us by God. And the way we know it is because of some of the points that Bishop has taught us tonight. And so we thank God for those of you who are here to join us. Uh, Tamika Brown, uh, thank you for being out with us tonight. Sharon Brooks, uh, thank you for being here with us tonight. Barbara Ammons, praise God and hallelujah. Uh, William Black. We thank God for all of those who are here on YouTube and even on Facebook, Adin India Johnson, we thank God for you, uh, Lucas White, Walt Smith, 
Yeah, Bishop absolutely taught. What an awesome lesson. And we thank God for the rich Bible class. You know, you know, and, and speaking of which, our bishop is on his way. You, we thank God for um, uh, the, the gift that is our bishop. Bishop, what an awesome lesson. I, I didn't want you to stop, Bishop. You, you, you know, those of us who read our Bible, yeah. um, sometimes we read it casually. Mm -hmm. But thank God uh, for you, and I say this when you're not around either, okay. Bishop, that, that we get real rich insight uh, because of your teaching. You help us to discover these truths and principles in Scripture that the casual Bible reader can't, have them. can't, can't even get a hold of. Well, thank you. And so tonight's lesson really demonstrated that uh, for us. Mm -hmm. um, again, our theme for this uh, season, on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, yeah. The, the tabernacle was given to Moses. The Bible says that it was the pattern given from heaven. It's a pattern from heaven, right. That would show us how to live on earth. Talk about uh, tonight some of the, the correlations between the tabernacle and uh, the walk of, of the Christian. Yeah, yeah it, I think it's one of the slides. It, it says something like, um, um, the, the, old, the, the, in the Old conceals. Testament is, conceals the new, yeah. but it also reveals the new. Yes. So if you really want to know New Testament theology and understandings, you must study the Old Testament. Right. It's called in the Bible a type or a pattern right. of things to come. Right. So it's like being uh, in kindergarten and in first and grade, you learn just basic things, your ABCs, your colors, your numbers. But without those things, you can't understand physics later on. Right. So you've got to get those basic things. And many people, we have not, as leaders, given them the foundational understandings and then connected those with what you just asked me with the New Testament. So throughout the Bible, there are types and shadows. Yes. Probably one of the most repeated types in the Bible is Jesus, right? Because really, Jesus is in the Old Testament, right? Um, we were talking earlier today about the scripture in Acts chapter eight, yes, where the Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah fifty-three, right? That says something like, you know, he was wounded for our transgressions and so forth and so on. Uh, and the and the eunuch asked Philip, "Who is he talking about?" Right. He says, and from that moment, Philip preach Christ right. unto him from Isaiah. Right. Because Christ is, he's, he is either uh, 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 a, a revelation of God in the Old Testament right. or he's a type of God in the Old Testament. Um, in that Daniel, when the king had this vision right. Right. about a stone right. that was hewed out the mountain, he started rolling down the mountain and it hit this great idol. Right. That really, that stone is Jesus. Right that Daniel saw rolling down, gaining momentum, the Christian faith that strikes the adversary and, and, and obliterates him. Right. And, and so these in the Old Testament are rich examples of the new. Yes. So I tell people, you've got to do some study. Yes. You've got to read and, and, and sit down and, and break through with a group and with, with teachers those things. If you do, they say, how do you know all that stuff? Because early on, I was, right. taught, I was taught to dig, and, and then the ministers and my pastor and others helped me to become a daily Bible student, and some of us even went to school, and so you learn those things. Right. Now, the enemy is hoping that you never learn them. Right. He, right. The enemy wants you to be happy, but not empowered. Right. But the Word of God, when you understand it, and you can apply it to your life, wow, he makes you almost invulnerable. So yeah, those are some of the examples of where, again, um, another example is Abraham and Isaac right. going right. up on the mountain of sacrifice. Right. right, right. You know, we talked about that. So the Lord says that to, to, to Abraham, take your son, your only, only son, son, your son of promise. Right. God had told Abraham in his old age, he had a son, uh, he had a son in his old age. Then the Lord says, take him on the mountain and kill him. Yes. Now, that doesn't make any sense. First of all, it's barbaric. Right. Number two, <laughs> there can be no promise if the son is dead. Right. But in the New Testament, it says about Abraham, he did not stagger right. at the promise of God. That's right. He believed that if he followed God and killed Isaac, that God would, from a dead son, yes. raise up nations. That's right. Of course, when he got there, Isaac says this, and Isaac was not a, was not a little boy. He was in his 20s. He said to his father, he said, Father Abraham, I, I see the altar. Right. I see the wood. I see the things we're supposed to light on fire, but where is the sacrifice? Yes. 
And, and the Bible reports that Abraham said, God himself yeah. will reveal the sacrifice. And as he goes to carry out God's order in obedience, the Lord says, Abraham, look in the thicket. Yeah. There's a lamb. And the lamb becomes a sacrifice. Yeah. So it teaches us again that in the Old Testament, if you read carefully, if you, if you seek to know God, you will know God better from those teachings that show us that God, the word of God is yeah. never stale and dull. Right. We make it dull because right. we don't understand how to dig it. You know, Bishop, you've taught us, um, those of us who listen intently, you've always said to us that Old Testament, again, validates the New Testament. Yes. Uh, what did the apostles have except the Old Testament? What they have given mm -hmm. us is just the New Testament's interpretive view after the, after the church has been formed of what they learned from the Old Testament. Yeah, and what you're alluding to is what a lot of Christians don't know, that when, when the 12 walked the earth, there was no New Testament. Right. There right. wasn't, it didn't exist. Right. It was just the Old Testament that they had been taught. But from that, the Holy Spirit now moves on these people to write the divine mind of God in the New Testament. But that's because they had learned the lessons of the Old Testament. Even now when we're going to start with this journey after resurrection to Pentecost, right. you will see many of the Old Testament teachings that will be revealed in the New. When they receive the Holy Spirit speaking to other languages, they, they said, uh, are not all these Galileans? Right. How do we hear them speak in their our own language? And, and, and the people, and the Lord said to the apostle, they are not drunk, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. If you read Joel chapter 2, he predicts the Holy Spirit. Right. So right. these are the things that the apostles were aware of as they were happening. They realized, oh, my God, it's a fulfillment of the Old Testament. Yeah. And so you're right. Uh, I think sometimes we have done God a disservice as disciples. We have not studied. We yeah. have not sought to know him better. Uh, and just like, you know, in science or in the world, in business, things get better. Christians must get better, too. And if we're not studying, we're not going to get better. Yeah, Bishop, and so tonight you started out with a very, I think, critical point about progression yeah. um, and, and how to progress in our knowledge of God. Um, God is a progressive God. We learn about him progressively through Scripture. And I think, you know, this, the question we're asking tonight is to share and discuss exactly how uh, and by what methods are we to use in order to know him. Yeah. So, so, again, and I'm sure you can do a much better job of this, but progressively we learn about the things of God yeah. in the Old Testament. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, our responsibility to pay attention to how we should learn. Well, again, I think there are methodologies of learning. Yes. You know, so I'm in medicine. Right? I always tell people, you know, I've, I've been a physician since 1975. I'm a senior attending in our uh, institution. I'm, I'm a senior person in our university. But if I don't keep my credits up every year, yes. when I go to the hospital and put my name in, it goes, Bum! In other words, if I don't keep up, they will not revalidate my credentials. Yes. So what does that mean? That means when I go to, like, uh, a lecture, it's not I have not heard that, I haven't heard it before, but I heard it in a time that we knew this much about it. The person who discovered more will do the lecture, and now I'll know this much about it. Right. So it doesn't mean what I learned before, I don't, it wasn't right. It, it means I learned better. Yes. And so the same thing in the, in the spiritual things, that what things help us to do that? Number one, the word of God. Number two, it should be the, the community of believers. Right. When he to tells us to walk together, it's because iron sharpens iron. Yes. I learn from you. You learn from me. We learn from one another. You don't learn by yourself. Right. People say, I just, you know, people tell me this. I come to your church. I don't, I don't come the whole time. I come, I know you, you're going to be up preaching, and I come and get the word, and then I leave. And yes. I say, you're going to be stunted in your growth. Right. You can't come on your own and get the word and then grow. You must have some kind of connection with the body of Christ, right. with multiple gifts and multiple anointings, so that what you don't have, they have, and you learn that. So it's the word of God, it's the community of believers, it's, it's a private prayer life and a corporate prayer life. Yeah. All of these things together 
help us to grow in the Lord. And the minute you, I told my pastors, if, if you stop studying, your church is going to stop growing. Yes. Because you are the lid to the knowledge of God and the light of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. So, again, I talk to leaders in our church. You must lead not only with what you say and preach. The Bible says precept and example. Yes. It means you quote the scripture, but you live it. They can see it. Yes. Yes. Another method how we how we grow. Bishop, the t again, going back to the tabernacle, um, such rich insight on that for us uh, tonight. I, I'm sure we could spend not just days, we spend months talking about what are some of the highlights for you that really you think we should focus on when we when we compare the tabernacle and the life of Christ well, again, and his high priestly role. I'm yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, you know, you, you're right. You, you, you can choose any of the structures uh, of the tabernacle and teach, I think, enough to get a diploma. Mm. Yeah, whether it's the brazen altar, what is that? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. In, a, in the American church, we have almost castrated any sacrifice. We do things by convenience. Yes. But the altar, brazen altar, Jesus, no, you must be sacrificial. Yes. It must cost you something. Uh, again, last week we did, we did foot washing, the labor. Yes. How as a community we should wash each other's feet. We have responsibility to help each other day to day. To, to be better, to be cleansed. Um, the holy place, yes. with all of the furniture that depicts Christ and his disciples, to each one of those structures is a type of Christ and of the church. Right. They're both present in all those instruments. And then, of course, the holy of holies, you know, he's above the mercy seat. That, that's God himself. But, yeah, so all of those things you could utilize really as a way to teach us how to know God better. And so again, we thank you all for um, your comments tonight. Uh, uh, Melanie says attending Christian Ed is a way she they're answering our question good, good. tonight on yeah. how well do we know him, and again share and discuss exactly how and by what methods are, are we to use in order to know him. And again, Bishop, I, I'm, I'm we're grateful uh, because of this lesson tonight. But we thank God for Pastor who uh, has applied himself to the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's obvious, Bishop, you know, that not only can we recite it, have memorization of it, but you've got to live it. Yeah, that's, that's the most important thing. I, th I thought about something as you were teaching about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, now, this is what I've learned. Bishop is here. He can correct me. That it was made out of um, Akia wood mm -hmm. and covered in gold. Yeah. And the symbolism there is that even though the, the wood represents flesh, yeah. that the gold represents divinity. Covers and it. for us, that's where sacrifice happens. And so, again, I, I think um, what we're learning and what we will continue to learn will help us to be more in love with reading the scripture. Yeah, and, and, and again, I, just that, that, that example you gave, I hope in the upcoming weeks uh, and so that we even as apostolics, we must understand, I said something last week about the whole issue of foot washing. Um, chapter 13 teaches us humility. Yes. And don't get me wrong, just, just if people can listen for a moment. Humility is not an attribute of God. Right. Humility is an attribute of Jesus. When you mention the wood and the gold, the gold is God. Right. It doesn't cost anything, but the wood is what brings the glory. Yes. Because Christ, as a person, chose to suffer. Yeah. Christ, as a person, had flesh and blood and had and died a painful death. Yes. God cannot die a painful death. It takes the committed flesh. It would teach believers that. We must become like him. Yes. Not only like God, which we, we will, but we become like Christ, who humbled himself and did all these things and shed his blood. All of these things would teach us that we honor Christ as apostolics and as those, again, who don't have that label. I think it's, it's, it's not always properly represented. That it is, it, is, it, is the, it is the human, it is the man in Christ that makes us bow down. Right. That's why at the name of Jesus, yeah. 
Every knee is going to bow. Yeah. Every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. Because it took commitment for him to do that. That's our direct application as Christians. What is your level of commitment yeah. to becoming like him? So yeah. I, I've enjoyed it. Hey, everybody that's online, thank you. Uh, the Lord bless you. And uh, keep on being with us. If you can be here in person, come join us, uh, especially these next few weeks as we journey toward Pentecost. God bless you all in Jesus' name. Thank, thank you, you, Bishop. Appreciate glad, it. Glad to be a part. Praise the Lord, saints. These are some hot groups. Y'all should be here every Wednesday for these hot groups. In the name of Jesus. All right, I think we're going to have reports now, right? Have they given you guidelines on how long you have? It's not a sermon at, it's not a, <laughs> a complete review of the whole teaching. But we want, do want to hear from you. I had a great time upstairs uh, with the online group. And so uh, let's start with Brother D. Thank you, everybody. Uh, representing group six. Woo! Representing group six. Woo! Thank you. All right. Ours, uh, <laughs> we'll answer the, the second question. Uh, we have to remember, everybody, the goal is the relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, memory. I have to remember that the Lord brought you out before, that he was victorious before, made you victorious before, he'll make you victorious again. Meditation, fasting, mm. prayer, and fellowship. All right. Praise the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Praise him. I'm representing group three. 
front runners. Um, so in terms of how well do we know him, we talked a lot about in the group, some people feeling like their discernment has increased, um, and also people setting future goals to know more scripture as a way to know him better. Mm. Um, and also, uh, a key part, you know, people talk about how long they've known God, some 30 plus years, but like a part of knowing God is knowing that you will never fully know him, mm. um, and that being a key part of your knowledge of him. And then in terms of what we can do and methods we can use to increase our knowledge, of him uh someone said being honest about our intentions with god when we're talking to him are we genuinely interested in him or are we seeking something for ourselves Ooh. um and that being the first step to knowing him and also that we just know him through our suffering like the scripture says so that through was your through, work through our suffering Ooh, all right and the fellowship of the suffering yes ma'am i feel like you all were over here in our class because that's what we've come to the conclusion of also a lot of our seasoned saints, as well as the new saints. Uh, group one, right, right, right. See, they want to cheer. You didn't get them a chance. <laughs> I just want to get into it. Um, so now I forgot. The, the suffering. Lord. The suffering. Yes, they come to the conclusion that <laughs> we, as, as long as we've known God, all we know better is that we don't know Mm. like we think we should know. Okay. And, and somebody very wise said, well, we cannot know God. He's an infinite God and we are finite. And um, someone else said, it's a choice mm. that we make. He, he wants to be known. He wants us Ooh. to know him. Yeah. We have to make a choice to turn away our plates, to pray, to get up and, and sacrifice so that we can know him better. All right. Yes, ma'am. Representing group number seven. <laughs> Amen. Dealing with uh, how do we know him? How can we know him? We talked about putting on the whole armor of God. Mm -hmm. And when we put on that armor of God, that's Ooh. our training. But the things we go through, the things that each one of us have, or the crosses that we each have to bear, mm -hmm. we need to use those, that training that we get from putting on the whole armor of God and when we go through those things, the experiences that we have help us to grow even more in, in him. Wow. Also, we grow by our testimonies, by helping someone else. We go through th things, God allow us to go through things so that we can be a testimony to help somebody else to go through things. So Glory. as we put on his armor, as we go through things in life, those are the ways that we get to know him better. And as we read his word and study and, and get to know him, just like you would get to know a person. How would you get to know a person? You would look at them. You would watch what they do, you watch what they say, you see how they act. All of that is in his word, so we have to get in his word deep. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> okay. We are here to represent the pretty good group, too. I was going to say, I was trying to say, I was trying to say pretty, pretty massive, as you can see. I, I, I managed to change my words there. But we wanted to start off with question one, where we had a couple of people talking about this thing where they feel like some days they know God better than others. And to follow up on that for group, I mean, for question two, in that we had a couple of gardeners here and they were talking about things like they get to know him through the soil and through seasons and Ooh. through sprouting through darkness and throughout different periods of hardship, they can get to know God better. And even being just in silence can help a person to better just think of their thoughts because it's a hard thing just to be there in silence thinking because that's going to put a lot of pressure on their mind. And they use that pressure to think through and think about God. And they can use just normal life things. And they can see and ask themselves, how can I see God through this? Be careful, y'all. I done told y'all. 
Y'all want me to follow that? <laughs> it, it's not fair. It's I not fair. You. I would want to follow him. My group says you get to know God through prayer, through mm -hmm. his word, and most importantly, through the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. You have experience with God. You got history with God. So it builds an intimacy when, and you get to know him deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. We have decided that God wastes no experience whether Ooh. it was falling into sin or not. Wow. Every part of your life factors into the equation of your life. People have to see something in you and that something comes through trial and Ooh. tribulation. You have to have a relationship with God in order to influence other people. If you love God, it flows out of every pore in your body and it affects everything and everyone around you. Somebody say amen. Wow. I think we're learning. I think we're learning. Yes, sir. I'm representing group five. <laughs> Not just the group. Oh. Oh, yeah. And it was led by Brother Joseph. But yeah, just to go over some of the points here, um, let me go ahead. So the first thing, we're answering uh, question number two. Um, when I was in the worst predicament of my life, I got to know him through his still small voice. Mm. Um, by building that relationship, going to Sunday school, going to Bible class, that's how I got to know the Lord. Difficult circumstances helped me or revealed God in a deeper way. Um, when you have no control over the situation, when you can't manipulate whatever it is that you're uh -huh. going through, you have no choice but to get to know God. Ooh. When going through difficult times, applying his word through the test will help you know God in an even deeper way. And then we ended it with, as you get to know him, you will begin to thirst for him. That's it. Wow. I hope we're catching these numbers. All of them are good. Uh, yes. Amen. So we represent the E-Church, the wonderful E-Church. And, and really, we had Bible study part two, the afterglow with our bishop. <laughs> Let's give God praise again for that awesome Bible study from our bishop. Amen. And, and so everyone said so many wonderful things, but one of the things that I took away and was uh, reiterated by those on the E-Church was that the three main things that we use in order to know God was one, the word of the Lord, uh, the, and prayer, but Bishop, I think you said it is community also. Mm -hmm. Iron sharpening iron. You know, it's one thing to be on an island by yourself. You can't know the word of God unless you have some interaction with it in the perspective of others. And so community is an essential part of our growth and development in knowing the word of the Lord. Amen. Give yourselves a hand. Tremendous uh, interactions, uh, again, and tremendous presentations. All of these things we hope will just kind of motivate us and commit us uh, to walking together. We've tried to emphasize that. And again, if you go online in the next couple of days, you, again, we will start you out with uh, this journey to Pentecost. This really kind of dovetails with it. Uh, maybe we will intermittently through these next six weeks share a little bit more about, again, how what Christ will teach us um, in that last week of life, I, I'm just committed to discovering more and more about him. Some of the richest parts of his ministry was the private ministry with the 12. But then you know that he, he shifted in the last moments from the 12 to the 3. That he went to a place called Gethsemane. I don't think there's a place uh, as emotion filled, uh, as filled with human insight. Uh, Mark, in particular, in his gospel, explains that he was almost depressed, that he threw himself to the ground. And I was sharing with the E-Church that, you know, sometimes uh, our emphasis is apostolics, you know, is, is the divinity of Jesus. But you do understand that the, the great glory of God, the great majesty of the Lord, it was not in his divinity, it's in his humanity. 
A God cannot feel pain. God cannot shed blood. God cannot miss people. But when he put on flesh and did all that for us, that's why the heavens declare the glory of God. That's why every knee is going to bow to his, his surrendered humanity. He, 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 he said, I've said this many times, he could have called legions of angels to defend him if he wanted to, and he never did. You know, the, a, a part that the, the old uh, saints taught us, you know, maybe it was broken English or whatever, and he never said a mumbling word. He never said a mumbling word. They crucified my Lord, and he never said a mumbling word. They nailed him to the tree, and he never said a mumbling word. That kind of love cannot be faked. That kind of glory cannot be earned by just simply what you do is how you worship him. And so I hope that we will, uh, again, intermittently as we go toward uh, Pentecost, uh, understand that it, in St. John 17, as I said before, the prayer he prays are for those who are left. Turn, turn your neighbor for the last and say, neighbor. neighbor. He was praying for you. I pray not for these alone. I pray for those that will believe on me through their word. I, I pray for the church of 2024. I pray for the trustees and deacons and members and choir members and uh, uh, praise dancers and singers and workers in the kitchen. I pray for them. I pray that they may carry out the mission of Christ. That's our prayer tonight. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, you can come now. If you're not born again, you can come right now. All things truly are ready. Everything has been prepared. Most of all, the blood has been shed on a cross called Calvary. The lamb has been slain for you. And so tonight, if you need him, will you come? We're not going to prolong the service, but if you're here tonight and you need Christ in your life, this is the opportune time. He says, the day you hear my voice, heart, give the Lord praise for those who are coming. Yes. Give him real praise. Give God praise. Whosoever will, let them come. Give God praise. I'm, I'm not surprised that young people are coming. Give the Lord praise. That's it. Okay, give the Lord praise for couples coming. Clap your hands and make some noise for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's a faithful God. He's a faithful high priest, and he's entered into the Holy of Holies, and he shed his blood for you and I. Somebody else wants to come. Again, all things are ready. Give God praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for dying for me. Give the Lord praise. Thank you for suffering for me. Thank you. Give God high praise. My God, you are great, and you are greatly to be praised. And there's nobody like you, God. There's nobody but you. You are the only wise God. We give you glory, honor, and praise. What a wonderful, wonderful time to hear the voice of God. Give the Lord praise at the responding to his voice. You see, my sheep hear my voice. Give the Lord praise for that. That's, that's a great blessing. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them. That's it. Yes. Yes. Glory to the hand, Lamb of God. Glory. Glory, honor, and praise. Hallelujah. That's right. That's right. Glory. Give the Lord praise. Come on. Here I am. You bow down. Here I am, Lord. Here to say, to say that, that you're my God. You're my God. Here I am, Lord. You're all together. together. Lovely. All together. That's right. All together. You're worthy. so worthy. All, all together. together. Wonderful all to together. me. Glory. Here I am. 
to worship. Here I am, Lord. I come to bow down. Give him praise. I come to say that you're my God. Glory. You're all together lovely. Yes, you are. You're so worthy. All together one. You're full too. I'll never know. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross. I'll never know. Thank you, Lord. How much it costs. Just to see my sin, to see my sin upon the cross. Upon the so here I am. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that. Your Lord, you're all together. You're lovely, Lord, all together worthy, all together wonderful to give the Lord great praise tonight. What a wonder, what a joy. What a blessing when people have the courage to come down the aisle and say, I want the Lord in my life. I need to know Christ. I want to walk with God. I, I want to be renewed. Every time that happens, do not take it for granted. You have no idea of what they've been through and what God has sent to them to rescue. Give God praise. To make free again. To deliver. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Repentance is a great gift of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. It means God is still working with you, working on you, working through you, working for you. What a mighty God we serve. We're going to receive our evening's offering tonight very quickly. You know how to give, and we give mainly electronically. You can do that if you need an envelope to give. You can also give by paper, and hallelujah, we still receive good old cash. Hallelujah. You don't see much of that. I go to Dunkin' Donuts. Everybody got their little app and all. I mean, they don't. I don't know. We, we live in a different age. Is that what she does? Uh-huh. She got one of those Dunkin' Donut things. Yeah. God is good to us as we prepare to give tonight in the name of the Lord. Come forward, servers, quickly as we give. It should take us less time on a Wednesday night than on a Sunday morning to lift the offering. Father, as we come in giving, we give you thanks, praise, glory, and honor. We receive the gifts that have been given by your people, both those who are online, those who are here in present, that we may fund and build your kingdom, that you might be pleased with all that we do as good stewards. We give you thanks and praise for those that want to give and have not the means, but for all of us, we are grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Please give quickly.
Sing the verse. There's a name above all names. There a name above all names. You're worthy, Lord. You are worthy of all praise. Our hearts will sing. And my heart will sing. How great is our God. One more time, there's a name above all names. Oh, Lord, there's a name above all names. You're so worthy. God bless you. Let's stand together. All praise, our hearts will sing. How great is our God. He is great. We say it often. I hope it never gets old to you. Great is the Lord. Great and to be praised. Remember, in the city of our God, the psalmist is so wonderful. In the mountain of his holiness, if you need to be reminded, walk about Zion. Yeah, I love those phrases. Walk about Zion. Go round about her. Count the towers, mark the bulwarks, consider the palaces. Why should I do that? That you may tell it to generations following. For this God is our God. He's our God forever. <laughs> he shall be our guide even unto death. My God, you're great. Hmm. Father, we thank and praise you for your magnificence, for your awesome glory and kindness, for your grace and mercy that you bestow upon us. Hallelujah. Although we contribute nothing, you are everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are great and you are greatly to be praised. Father, we thank you for the privilege of belonging to you. Thank you for the privilege of being able to speak your name in safety. Thank you, God, that we have been given unction of the Holy Spirit and that we can walk in faith. We thank you now for the growth that you have engineered this night. Thank you for the every deposit of the seed, the garden, that you are growing in our spirit, that we may bear fruit unto repentance, that we may bear fruit to share with others, that we may allow your kingdom to truly come and your will to be done. Now, God, go with us, and we beg and ask you to encamp round about us. We pray for our nation. We pray for our city. We pray for our president. We pray for our mayor. We pray for elected officials. We pray most of all for the church of Jesus Christ that we may walk before you in a dying world. Now, go with us and encamp round about us. Keep us safe and saved. We will be careful to give your name the praise, honor, and glory. Of this we are assured. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember uh, uh, Principal Tally, he told me Sunday one of the young men in the school was killed. Remember the, what he's under. Let's make sure we help him as he goes through these things. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, he's a good God.